Now, another episode of As the Dial Turns. This episode, making a call on a number five crossbar exchange. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell made his first telephone call to Thomas Watson. It was a direct connection, as is here, no exchange. Two years later, the switchboard was invented by George Coy. It supported only eight telephone lines, initially with 21 subscribers attached in a shared party line fashion. In time, rotary dial-based exchanges were developed. culminating with the advanced number five crossbar exchange, each serving many thousands of subscribers. The first number five crossbar system was installed in 1948. There were about 6,500 installed over the next 25 years. Its forerunner, the number one crossbar system, was introduced in 1938. What exchange operations are needed to complete a call to another subscriber in the same office? Let's find out. What is a crossbar switch? It's an XY matrix switch, one pictured here. This Western electric model weighs about 30 pounds and is made mostly of steel. It's about 21 inches, 53 centimeters long and nine inches, 23 centimeters tall. Here are 10 vertical holding electromagnets at the bottom and 10 connected vertical rods. Here's a single vertical electromagnet out of 10. There are 10 horizontal selector magnets, six on the left and four on the right. Here are two horizontal magnets connected to the same horizontal rod. Interestingly, there are only five horizontal rods. Let's see how this works. If I activate this electromagnet, the finger moves down. So this rod here, this rod here tilts. Just a little bit up, tilts up or tilts down. Now, if I activate the vertical member and the fingers in neutral, nothing happens. If I tilt the rod down, those contacts close. Neutral, nothing happens. If I activate the electromagnet to tilt the rod up, those contacts close. This switch type had many benefits over others available in the 1930s and 40s. For one, it had a minimum of mechanical movement for contact closure. It was highly reliable. Second, up to 20 separate connections can be held simultaneously on the largest version. Here is a partial view of 10, 200 cross point switches in a frame. These are wired together to create a large switching fabric. Chiefly, these make the talking path connections between subscribers. In 1952, Bell Labs engineer Charles Clow provided rigorous mathematical methods to build any size crossbar fabric made of smaller switches. His work is still used by modern day network engineers. Next, an example of call routing using a basic nine input, nine inputs here, nine output crossbar fabric made up of nine smaller three by three switches. Here's one here. This one is expanded to see its nine internal switches. Cross point here, cross point here, each controlled by external means. Let's simulate a new call. From a very high level, the called subscriber is routed first to the inter-office trunk over three internal crossbar switches. The inter-office trunk provides ringing voltage, tones, and supervises the call's progress. In a real exchange with thousands of subscribers, there'll be many switches pooled to create the fabrics. When a call is made, a route is nailed down for the length of the call. Next, the other side of the trunk is routed to the caller's phone over three crossbar switches. 
Note that the middle switch supports two separate routes. Once the call has ended, the five switches drop their connections and their interoffice trunk is returned to the idle pool. Central to the number five exchange are two standalone switching fabrics, each made of hundreds of switches. Here's a basic view of the two main fabrics. One is called the line link frame and the other fabric is the trunk link frame. The line link portion connects to the subscribers and the trunk link connects to internal trunks, remote exchanges, and other equipment. But what controls the routing through the fabrics? Notice the equipment inside the red outline. At a high level, all of this is a routing controller. Central to this is a brilliantly engineered device for managing path routing. It is called the marker. It is the brains of the outfit. Actually, there are two different marker types per exchange. Their operations are combined into one to simplify this diagram. Each marker is separately active for about 0.25 seconds during call establishment. Nifty idea. The marker has several responsibilities. It locates resources, for example, a trunk going to a remote office for a talking path. It runs free and busy tests on equipment. Is that subscriber busy? Is that device available? And it nails down routes in the switching fabric. Here's a picture of a marker crammed with relays. Some versions had more than 1,500 relays. In 1938, before computers, a marker was the most complex logical processor ever built. At age 20, living in San Francisco, this author stood before a marker during a busy calling hour. It was amazing to see and hear the relays loudly pounding out orders. There were 15 other markers throbbing away in the same office. The experience left an indelible mark on me. What are the other elements inside the red box? One is the originating register. It provides dial tone and remembers the dial digits. Then it is freed. In the number five system, there are eight types of connectors. Only four are shown in this example. They are typically made of large 30 contact relays. They temporarily connect a marker with other equipment for control purposes. These four connectors are the line link connector, the trunk link connector, the group number connector, and the originating register connector. There's also a group number device on the bottom left. Its operation will be explained in a moment. Okay, it's time to make a call. When this subscriber goes off hook, the marker here, with the help of other elements, connects the caller to the originating register using path one. As such, recorded digits are passed to the marker over path two to the originating register connector once all the digits have been entered. Next, the marker examines the dial digits and determines that the call is to a subscriber in the same office, an intra-office call. Their marker over path three seizes a trunk link frame with an idle intra-office trunk. So this device is now in a held reserved state. At the same time, the marker seizes the number group frame over path four. This device maps the called number to the location of the called line on the line link frame, which should be here. So this device here provides the information so the marker can identify this point here where the called number connects to the line link frame. 
Here is a partial picture of the number group frame at the Connections Museum of Seattle. At the top, we see 200 large multi-contact connector relays. The wiring field is the map between the called number and its wired location on the line link frame. The marker uses this information to determine if the called line is busy using path 5 on the line link frame. If not busy, the marker performs its magic and closes the appropriate crossbar contacts in the two fabrics to connect the called subscriber to one side of the inter-office trunk, path 6. So the marker forges this path here. At this point, the call path is 50% connected. Next, the marker seizes the calling line again. This is referred to as callback on the line link frame and routes the second port of the inter-office trunk to the caller, as in such, connecting point three here, path three. If the caller answers, the conversation begins. Hello. When the call is complete, all the crossbar connections are released and the inter-office trunk is freed. It's important to note that the inter-office trunk provides ringing signals, ringing tone to the subscriber, and monitors the call. A typical inter-office call requires about 1,300 relay operations. This coverage just scratches the surface of call setup. Check out the site calling315.com to learn more about electromechanical switching and crossbar operations.